On this week's XJA Talk Show, we dig a little deeper into why the Renegade isn't going to India and how you can get yourself and your Jeep into JP Magazine. We have some voicemails to share, as well as some YouTube love to spread around and the long-awaited return of Josh's subconscious. It is hurricane season, so we're going to cover some of the basics of safety and preparedness to keep you and yours happy and well. We also have a new All Things Wrangler where Steve describes lifting your YJ. So you don't want to miss the next XJ Talk Show. The XJ Talk Show is for entertainment purposes only. Any advice or information provided on this show should be verified by alternative sources prior to making any changes or modifications to your vehicle. We are not experts, just people that enjoy the Jeep hobby and don't mind talking endlessly about it. P.S. We love you. <laughs> XJ Talk good. Show is on the air. <laughs> okay, it's a podcast. Oh, you know what I mean. Anyway, here's Tony and Josh. Yes, yes, it is Tony, and that is Josh, and uh, we're having a little bit of fun. I was going to say, wave, you bastard, but he was waving, and he just kept waving, so that's why he got the, the camera all to himself, and while we were giggling. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you weren't here for the pre-show, you don't really get the joke, but uh, in our, our last week's promo, uh, Josh, uh, uh, I used uh, the, the part of the show where uh, Josh didn't wave at the camera at the start, and uh, I had posted up there, uh, or put on the screen, while he was just looking away, far looking looking far and away, not paying any attention to the show, he doesn't jeep wave either. <laughs> so if you didn't catch that promo, please have a look because I spent like two hours on it. <laughs> so anyway, this is episode one forty four, and as I said, I'm Tony. You know me as Mudderoy on xjtalk.com, and uh, here's my co-host that's already trying to talk. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, you guys know me as Josh, NW99XJ, or Northwest99XJ over at XJTalk.com. I'm glad you guys have joined us. And this is all. This is the kind of stuff you guys have got to join in on the live show for, the pre-show, the, the mayhem, and, and all the fun and stuff like that. And, of course, the inside jokes. <laughs> That's what she said. No, that doesn't really fit, does it? Oh, she said that, though. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what do we got for the kids tonight, Josh? Oh, we got all kinds of good stuff for you guys. We're going to do some This Week in Jeep, of course. Got a couple good stories for you as well there. Uh, we're going to have Steve join us later on for a little bit of Jeep Garage and talk about what we can do with some YJs. Got some YouTube love to share with you guys, some voicemails. Uh, we're going to talk about some hurricane safety. Jeez, I got some stuff to share with you about my own Jeep and more and more and more. So guys, stick around. We've got a jam-packed show for you and hopefully we'll be able to get to it all. Hey, this is the XGA Talk Show, a podcast about Jeep Cherokee's off-roading and the tech you need to get you there and back. We're here to promote the web's most premier website for all that is Jeep Cherokee, the xgatalk.com. Uh, not show, but the website. Uh, the friendliest and most helpful Jeep site on the web, xgtalk.com, encourages and answers all the questions and concerns the first time XJ owners typically have without any flaming or criticism, while all while giving you the best, most in-depth articles and write-ups for the repairs and modifications that take your average XJ to the next level. Now get ready. It's the XJ Talk Show, and it starts right now. First week in G. So as I reported earlier this month, Jeep is going to be moving to India. Well, not necessarily moving, not as in packing up and leaving, but they're going to be offered in India for the first time ever, from what I understand. And I reported last, uh, what was it, what, episode 142, I think, is I don't know why uh, the Renegade is not going to be offered there. They've uh, opted to not offer the Renegade in their release uh, over in India. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't know why anybody would really care here in the U.S., but the Renegade is not going to be a part of that initial launch. Well, this they're Indians. Comes, Maybe they're afraid they would be hurt, their feelings would be hurt if they called it the Renegade. Well, I'd, I'd be <laughs> very curious to see if they actually end up renaming it, because uh, the Renegade is supposed to be a global launch and, and is supposed to help Jeep dominate the world as far as automotive sales go. So I'd be very curious to see if they end up rebadging it or uh, calling it something else. Uh, who knows? Uh, anyways, uh, that initial launch uh, will not include a Renegade, and, and this news is coming straight from Mike Manley, the automaker's head of international operations and head of the Jeep brand. Allegedly, Jeep made the decision to postpone the Renegade launch in India because of currency fluctuations and because the company wasn't ready. I don't know exactly what that means, but I personally uh, would think that the Jeep Renegade would be one of Jeep's best sellers in India. 
It's the cheapest and smallest Jeep in the lineup, after all, which I would assume is perfect for the average Indian consumer, uh, especially in a fluctuating volatile market. Why, when the worth and availability of currency is in question, would the Indian consumer fork out twice the amount of money for some other Jeep? India will instead receive the Grand Cherokee, which we all know has a hefty price tag, and of course the Wrangler as its first vehicles from Jeep. The eventual goal of Jeep is to begin producing Jeeps in India. Mike Manley earlier this week said, if you're going to be successful with Jeep in India, you are going to have to localize vehicle production in India. Jeep does have extra production capacity in a factory nearby in nearby Pune. That could be an option as well for them. India will receive the Renegade eventually, but there's no say as to the time frame on that. Until then, to satisfy upcoming demand and to keep prices down, Jeep is going to have to find a way to push more Jeeps out of Pune. JP Magazine wants you guys. Have you ever wondered how you could get featured in JP Magazine? And by the way, if you don't know what JP Magazine is, then you need to crawl out from that rock you've been living under for the last 18 years. For those of you who don't know about JP Magazine, let me break it down to you. JP Magazine is essentially a do-it-yourself manual for any Jeep owner looking to restore, maintain, or modify their Jeep. And each issue contains articles on products, how-tos, upgrades, performance tests, product shootouts, and more. Events are also covered in the magazine from trail rides in the USA to international competitions and off-road events around the nation. Also featured are stories on Jeep history, news, and concept vehicles. The magazine covers Jeep trends and trends in the aftermarket industry as well. It's basically the most awesome Jeep publication ever printed, and you need to have a subscription. Well, getting into the world's number one Jeep-focused magazine might be easier than you think. There's really just three things you need to take into consideration. Chicks, oops, and age. Jeep chicks are, well, let's face it, pretty hot. And a little skin and a little bit of Jeep will go a long way if the, picture, if the picture taken has the right stuff. So that's easy enough, but what else? Did you roll? Did you get stuck? Is your Jeep four legs to heaven? Is it four feet deep in mud, buried in the snow? If your Jeep had a gnarly or questionable moment, or maybe just a momentary lapse in judgment of the driver, they want to see the evidence. They want, to, they want the story about what happened and how you made it unhappen as well. And finally, JP Magazine loves the nostalgia. Photos from back in the day is what this is all about. For example, maybe you had a family member serving in the military and have a neat photo of that person with a Jeep. Maybe your family road trip vacation when you were young uh, took place in a Jeep and you have the photo to prove it. They're essentially looking for vintage, but not a vintage Jeep doing its thing today. Nope. They want old timey. The older, the better. Don't worry if the photo is grainy and black and white. That reeks of vintage and JP Magazine loves to eat up the funky stuff. So that's it. Hot chicks, upside down Jeeps, and some old crusty photos from back in the day. That's all it's going to take to get you into JP Magazine. If you got all three, eh, even better. Just make sure you give them all the pertinent info and the who's and the where's and especially the what's your make and model and date and location the picture was taken. Email your submissions to jpeditor at jpmagazine.com with the subject line sideways. And make sure you tell them that the XJ Talk Show sent you. Hey, big thanks to John, pre-runner 1982, for submitting our first story for this week's This Week in Jeep. If you would like to submit a story to be aired on This Week in Jeep, or you have a response to any one of our stories, please send an email to newstips at xjtalkshow.com. Okay, so how many of you guys, raise your hand, how many of you guys got my bad joke when I was talking about the renegade and the Indians? It's the wrong kind of Indians, Josh. <laughs> no, I know. What the, yeah. Ooh, not the, uh, well, thank you very much, coming in. Um, <laughs> try the beef jerky it's very good uh yeah and the other thing is i noticed from your from your uh, uh news here um you poon right that's the uh, name of the name of the town it's, it's spelled p-u-n-e so maybe it's pune i i don't know it's, is that uh, in me, india is and that, of course I, I i there was a very very bad attempt at a very horrible off-color joke in there as well so yeah <laughs> is that is that in uh, that's in india right uh, somewhere nearby okay. is all. I, well, I, I, I really, I don't, I think I, I passed geography with like a D plus. So yeah. Anyway. So it, it, it reminded me because I don't know, I'm, I don't think you were, uh, you watched the, the moon launches, uh, back when they were doing them, but Tang was a big, uh, thing <laughs> back then. And that town, they really loved that Poon Tang. It was oh. just really really good hey who doesn't <laughs> right am i right <laughs> hey, 
it. That's my attempt at a really bad off-color joke. Yeah, yours probably uh, made a little more sense than mine. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I apologize profusely, but I had to get it out. It wasn't. It wasn't going to sit there. It was going to fester, and then I was at three o'clock in the morning. I was going to yell it out and wake everybody up. <laughs> and your wife's like, "No, not now." <laughs> Anywho, uh, <laughs> now I'm supposed to do something. Oh, here it is xjtalk.com is where you go when you're not off road and now you can go to xjtalk.com when you're off road too using your smartphone install the tap a talk app then search for xjtalk take xjtalk with you wherever you go jury duty dinner with your spouse's parents even well anywhere you need your xjtalk fix This is Dan from the 4x4 Podcast, and you're listening to the XJ Talk Show. The XJ Talk Show is now available on iTunes. Subscribe and leave a review. Also, be sure to give us a five-star rating. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or your MP3 player. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Show. Ah, uh, the YouTube love. Uh, guys, we do have some love to share with you all. As, uh, you have been doing a very good job of subscribing to our YouTube channel. Make sure you guys are telling a friend and, and getting them to do the same. We pick four out of the list in no particular order and, well, give them a little bit of homage every week. Uh, first on the list uh, this week, uh, who do you got, Tony? That is uh, Eric Matzuma. Matzunzan. Mat- Matuzan. Sure. Anyways, uh, we got Mud Raider on there as well. Uh, tennis golf and the Jeep lover 88. Uh, well, you can't go wrong with any of those words, actually. Uh, Jeep lover 69 would have been better, but 88's fine. I don't guess they actually made a Cherokee in 69, did they? I don't think so. Jeeps were being made back then, so uh, well, there was know. Jeeps in 69, just not Cherokees. Sure was. Sure was. <laughs> Anyways, guys, make sure you keep up the subscriptions, tell a friend, and uh, we'll see you over on our YouTube channel. Well, uh, man, we're already to voicemails. Ah, gee whiz. That's a, this thing is moving along kind of fast, isn't it, Josh? Well, we are moving right through. We got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. And, uh, well, I've, I've got some uh, stuff to share with you guys about my Jeep. And, you know, okay. when I start talking about my own Jeep, I get a little long winded. So, uh, yeah, we're moving through this stuff. So I get more time to talk. <laughs> and and you, you only recently realized you were long winded when I told you numerous times. <laughs> So here we go I, with the I voicemails. I'm going to cut you right off. No more talking, Josh. <laughs> hey, this is Tony. And this is Josh from the XJ Talk Show. We want to thank you for calling our 24-7 voice line. Yes, we do. Just leave your first name and your question or comment. There's no guarantee, but we may play your message on the podcast. Oh, and don't worry about keeping it clean. We'll take care of that. Now it's your turn to speak at the beep. Hey, this is Nikki G, and uh, just wanted to talk about uh, Obama. Came and visited our fair city today, as many people who watch news might have seen. Uh, he gave a good speech about the VA hospitals, and it was, it was a good speech, and it'd be great if he holds true on his promises, but only time will tell. But uh, my beef with that is a had Boyer Street closed off today. I was driving into work. I couldn't make my left-hand turn into my beloved Taco Bell. I had to continue on down the road, hop the curb, drive through an empty lot, and enter (laughs) the parking lot that way. So a good thing I have my Jeep. Uh, They give cell phones to the welfare recipients. But they deny me access to a beef and bean burrito. <laughs> what kind of country is this? I tell you what. All right, guys. Uh, you have a good one. And I'll chat you later. I'm Bye. surprised uh, Secret Service didn't tackle him to the ground, Jeep and all. <laughs> there he is. We know that guy. Get him, <laughs> man. I'm going for my 24th Amendment Taco Bell. <clears throat> you, the tinfoil hat, freeze. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for calling Nikki G. Here we go with uh, Jim. Uh, you know him as uh, Brazcats, one of our uh, 
illustrious moderators on xgtalk.com. Hey guys, it's Jim or Brass Cats. I just thought it was hilarious that uh, I ordered from Amazon some parts for my YJ that I have, and I ordered the you know the hood latch kit and some re- replacement soft top snaps and and all the other good stuff. And the uh, they finally came in today. However, the uh, the soft top snaps they come in sets of five or uh, individually. So I actually needed six, so I ordered a, a single, and then I ordered a set of five. So today I get them in, and there's only two in there, both individually packaged. Of course, I email Amazon because I'm missing four snaps, and they want me to uh, to return the individual snap to them, and uh, they they will send me the pat or the the, the whatever, the the pack of five, but they want to uh, pay several dollars to ship back a $1 item, and it's going to be this one little tiny snap in this gigantic box. I just thought that was kind of funny. Anyways, talk to you later. That, that's really strange. I've had that happen on occasion. Not that I've got the wrong order, but sometimes when something needs to go back because it, it has a problem or... I don't know. Nothing comes to mind. I usually get get my orders exactly as I I order them. But uh, one of the things you can do, Jim, is just go on to uh, Amazon Chat. You know, because there is no phone in Amazon. You can't actually call and and bitch at anybody at Amazon, which is which is probably good because it speeds things along. Because you know how people can get really wordy like that or on a podcast, and uh, <laughs> it takes up a lot of time. So, uh, but but they do do online chat. They're very helpful and. They can do anything up to and including signing your name over uh, to ownership of Amazon. I mean, they basically can do anything, uh, no matter where in the world they are. It's all about customer service. So get on chat, tell them, and say, you know, do you really want me to send this thing back? Uh, I mean, it probably would be cheaper for you to send me uh, 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 four or five individual uh, snaps than send this thing back to you so you can send me the right thing, you know. Uh, you make a suggestion and I think you'll be surprised also too, to keep you from having to go down and ship the thing back. That's the problem. That's the problem I'd have with it because they do pay to ship it back, but, uh, just, they don't, you know, come to your house and take it down there to the shipping place. Unfortunately, doesn't that kind of go with the old saying, uh, what, like spending a dollar to save a dime or something like that? It, yeah. I mean, they usually figure that stuff out on their own without having to say anything to them, but sometimes things fall through the cracks. So here's another Nikki G for us. Here we go. Hey, this is Nikki G, and uh, holy crap, I can't believe you guys played the whale song. Uh, <laughs> you guys have really hit rock bottom. Not yet. Uh, but uh, the only way it could possibly get any worse is if uh, somebody sang three minutes of chicken song. What? <laughs> 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 It can only go uphill from here, guys. <laughs> Bye, catch you later. Bye. And our uh, final voicemail, uh, he doesn't announce it, but this is also from Jim. <laughs> hey, guys, this is Nikki G. <laughs> I think the whale song was a big hit. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, now we've got, we got voicemails uh, making fun of voicemails. That is great. I love this. We'll, just start a, we'll start a voicemail podcast where all we do is play voicemails. We, we won't even talk or show up. It'll just be voicemails. Maybe occasional intro or something like that. Yeah, no, it's good stuff, guys. Keep we, it up. We do need to come out with uh, one of those uh, little commercials. Uh, uh, what was it? Nick Tell? Nick Tell, <laughs> Nick Tell presents the best of Nikki G. <laughs> yeah. play, maybe, play, maybe play a little flute in there for you know Kenny G. Anyway, cool. here's a here's a a, a much missed and uh, hasn't been on for a long time. Josh's subconscious. We can only only ex- uh, only figure that Josh has been so busy that his subconscious has not been active until recently. I guess it's that five day five days off you're taking, Josh. Mm. Oh man, 
and I've been so busy messing with my undercarriage. It's been so much fun. A lot of guys have been helping me with my undercarriage, and I've just enjoyed it so much. And Nikki G, wow, those whale songs, huh? Your sperm whale can play with my beluga any day. <laughs> Toodaloo. Hey, you had to see that one coming. Uh, oh, that's what she said. All right, so uh, <laughs> I don't know why I don't know why he doesn't anonymous doesn't do more of those, but uh, he really should. It's they're hilarious. I gotta keep it together over here. <laughs> you know, you're oh. having a good laugh when you fart. That's uh, <laughs> you lose all bodily control. <laughs> and I think I might eat a little. All right, so uh, you know it uh, t- taking a turn to the depressing, uh, not really, but uh, I saw a thing come up on uh, Twitter the other day, and uh, it was from the FCC, strangely enough. Uh, but uh, well, I guess they're talking about communication, so maybe it's not so strange. Anyway, boys and girls, it's hurricane season, and uh, if you're on the East Coast or the uh, the Gulf uh, along the the Gulf of Mexico, the part of the land that borders the Gulf of Mexico, you've you probably watch the uh, the the weather reports this time of year with uh, anxious anticipation, and uh, the FCC uh, had uh, some communication tips uh, during emergency, and I thought we'd just uh, go over them and discuss them a little bit and uh, make you guys aware of uh, what you need to keep in mind. I think the the most important thing is uh, to understand the cell phone service, but we'll get into that. So uh, basically, what the FCC FEMA has to say here is. Uh, uh, let me just move this over here. Know uh, what type of landline telephone service you have. Uh, some newer forms of telephone service will not work without electric power. Understanding whether uh, you have this newer type of service, such as voice over IP, which uh, is provided over broadband connections or more traditional fo- uh, or more traditional phone service, which typically is powered over copper telephone lines. Uh, what they're trying to say here is. Uh, there's a thing called POTS, plain old telephone service. And uh, that is just the copper wire that runs from their f- a facility that is quite often powered by a bunch of batteries, a huge bank of batteries. And they charge these batteries uh, constantly. And uh, there's so many batteries uh, that you can actually uh, keep one of these uh, uh, substations running for a good 24 to 48 hours. And, and you know, for calling 911 or... Uh, uh, calling it up and chatting during the middle of a storm, it's great because you you know you lose the power in your house, your phone still works. If you've got one of these new voice over IP services, it's using your internet connection. So if your internet goes down, so does your phone service. That means no nine one one, none of that. And of course, we all know, and you iPhone users know very sorely that <laughs> the uh, the phone is powered by electricity, specifically a battery. And uh, because I know you guys are always trying to recharge those things anywhere you go. Uh, So, uh, you know, you don't have any juice. Your battery runs out of power. You don't have any uh, cell service. There's no communications. So things to keep in mind whenever uh, there is bad weather, whether it's a hurricane or maybe just some of these storms that pop up uh, during the summertime. Yeah, that's the thing with, uh, with 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 especially cell phones. I mean, there might be some battery backup or some uh, you know reserve power cell phone towers out there, but you got to think, folks, that that a very large portion of the cellular network is going to go down, and the network is going to become extremely busy. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to have to look into alternative forms of communication if you need to communicate with loved ones, family members, uh, friends, and more importantly, even emergency services. Uh, so, I mean, this, this, you know, a great segue into, you know, the, another reason to seriously consider, especially if you're, if you're in a hurricane zone, uh, as to getting your, your ham radio license, uh, because, you know, you can power a ham radio with a, uh, with a car battery, especially if you've got one installed in your vehicle, uh, and you'd be able to communicate, uh, with others that way, uh, get the stress out, um, and, and even get some emergency commu- communications or instructions, uh, either receiving or transmitting. One of the wonderful things about uh, amateur radio is is that there's going to probably be some people involved in emergency communication. So even if you're not active uh, in the communicating of uh, high water conditions or uh, people that are injured or whatever that, you can listen to it and you can hear where, where these uh, things are going on and actually go there and help or just know how your area is being affected or maybe the area... 
uh, out of, from you that the storm is moving towards. So it's a great information tool. And of course, you can always key up the mic and uh, uh, ask a question or make a report. So yeah, amateur radio is very good for uh, these emergency communication situations because you're in control of the entire thing. You are in charge of the, the power that's getting to your radio. You're in charge of the antenna and you're in charge of the, the radio. Everything is in your control, whereas with a cell phone, you're at the mercy of a billion dollar or multi-billion dollar uh, network infrastructure that has been designed uh, just to let you chat and uh, have some cornflakes while you're doing it. Which uh, one of the things they mentioned here, uh, which I thought was very important, keep in mind that whenever there is a storm, uh, chances are good that the uh, circuits are going to be very congested. So Mm -hmm. if you don't need to be on the phone don't get on the phone because you may be keeping people from getting the emergency help that they need um you know try to stay off the phone with with mom and uh uh talking to her for a long time because you're you're not trying to make her feel better about what's going on and you know damn it damn it over here (laughs) and damn it be a good son and have her over at your house before the storm hits what's wrong with you anyway so just a couple of tips there, something to think about. We want all of our uh, XJ Talk uh, listeners to, uh, to be safe and uh, come back uh, very often. So guys, uh, we haven't been getting as many reviews as we normally would like uh, from you listeners out there. We'd like to encourage you guys to uh, please head over to Stitcher or iTunes and, and leave us a review. Uh, leave us a five-star review and please leave us a comment. Yes, please. Uh, we really, really appreciate the comments, the mini comments, because we do have a lot of iTunes reviews already. It's just we like it's it's nice to have something to read on the show, and it's always nice to hear kind words, and it's great to hear uh, uh, const- constructive criticism because uh, we'd like to make the show better always, and uh, just like uh, having uh, uh, Josh and other people uh, help with the show, it improves the show because it's not just one person's vision; it's a multiple uh, visions and. I think that appeals to more people. Indeed. And we, of course, love to hear from you guys. And uh, uh, speaking about hearing things, uh, there's this thing called audible.com. And it's a great place to go if you like to hear people read you a book. Now, if you're like me, you don't like to read. Heck, I pick up a book and it's going to take me six years to read it. I just get too sidetracked and too distracted. And, well, you know, I can't freaking read anyway. So uh, you need to head over to audible.com, actually audibletrial.com slash XJ talk show. You get a free audiobook from any one of their 150,000 titles to choose from across any imaginable topic. You get something for nothing, you get hooked up and well, you get entertained in the process. So audibletrial.com slash XJ talk show. Check it out. Hey Josh, what's going on? Boy, it sure is nice to be out here in the uh, the woods and the trees and the twigs and the ants and the oh, don't sit there. Yeah, that's an ant hill. That's not a lawn chair. What's going on here? <laughs> Clever, crafty ants. They were they were tricking me. <laughs> well, uh, as you guys have heard from the last couple episodes, uh, I had some exhaust carnage recently, and I uh, was uh, picked up a, a new exhaust. And actually, you know, I was going to grab it before the show, and I completely forgot I was going to bring it in here. And the reason why I still have it is because I didn't get a chance to install it. Uh, and uh, I didn't get a chance to install it because, well, my Jeep doesn't start right now. Uh, I've been having a, a serious issue. I, I have the no bus on the odometer. Uh, the uh, automatic shutdown circuit and uh, has tripped and of course that that means no spark no fuel pump no nothing Um, most of my dash doesn't work well most of the instrument cluster doesn't work uh, except for the odometer that reads no bus uh, after about uh, a good 30 seconds of trying to start it Uh, it will crank it just won't fire i've been racking my brain uh trying to you know troubleshoot this thing and uh and I've gone through most of the five volt sensor systems and been trying to uh, to troubleshoot troubleshoot this. And, and I, yes, I've replaced the crank sensor. Yes, I've checked every single fuse, guys. I've got all the details about this, everything that I've tried, everything I've discovered, and some helpful um, helpful advice from some other XJ Talk members over on my build thread over on XJTalk.com. Did you like uh, did share. you hit really hard on the dash? Right above the, yeah, the no, cluster, I, I did. I, I, I actually <laughs> took the instrument cluster out. I cleaned the contacts, oh, and, uh, and and that did help momentarily. And, oh, and well, I, you know that's had, you know that's where it is then. Well, yes, and it's no. a grounding issue. Uh, 
Yeah, there's there's uh, from, and I just found this out recently. There's there's a twisted pair of wires, uh, which pretty much is the main main bus, the main connection between uh, the P, the PCM, the power powertrain control module, the brain basically, um, and the instrument cluster. And I'm wondering if I've got a break, a short, um, an oxidation, something in that. So uh, this weekend, I'm going to be doing a lot of continuity testing. I'm going to be testing uh, the plugs themselves of a lot of the five volt sensors, and this, these the five volt system I'm talking about are uh, things like your, your throttle position sensor, uh, the crank position sensor, the camshaft position sensor. Uh, you know the, these sort of things. The, the O2 sensors are included in there, in there, but they the O2 sensors going out w- would not uh, cause the, no. the PCM to to trip the automatic shutdown circuit and not allow the Jeep to start. And of course, the whole no bus thing is 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 something altogether different. Well, wait so, a minute. I thought that the ninety seven pluses didn't have the the disable. I thought that was the prior to ninety sevens. No, that no, they do. Uh, in fact, uh, any any ninety seven to two thousand one Cherokee, you pop open the uh, the PDC, the Power Distribution Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got uh, there's usually like four uh, big relays in the uh, in the upper section closest to the firewall, and the two of those are, are what I'm talking about here. One of them is the automatic shutdown relay. And the other one is the relay for the the fuel pump circuit. So, and they are side by side. So, what causes uh, the, other, the automatic it, shutdown? Well, there's a number of things um, that that do it, and that's what I'm trying to track down right now is is why the PCM is sending that signal to the automatic shutdown relay and not allowing it to to kick over. Now, I've tried jumping that, like uh, basically putting in a, a fused jumper. Uh, to lie to that circuit to make it think that the automatic shutdown relay is right. is closed and not open or right. open and not closed. I can't remember right now off the top of my head which which is normal. Uh, in any case, I, I did the same thing to the fuel pump circuit and I got the fuel pump to turn on, but I still don't have any uh, spark at this point. So that's why I'm going to be going through and, and doing continuity tests. I've already tested all of the sensors in the five volt system, and everything seems to be in in uh, normal operating parameters. As far as you know, the testing procedures that are outlined in my factory service manual, and this usually entails uh, using a, a digital voltmeter and testing across a couple leads, measuring the resistance right. uh, or measuring voltage at a at a certain you know time during the cycle, and well, and uh, everything is seeming to be good. Yeah, let me ask you real quick. Maybe I missed this. When did this occur? What happened prior to this whole thing stopping to work? The Jeep sat in the garage for six days. Literally, yeah. there was there was nothing. I I I, I had driven it uh, the the week prior. Um, I had a gig that I had to DJ. Um, I pulled it into the garage. Um, had unloaded all my DJ gear. Pulled it back out of the garage and and nosed it in. And and there it sat for uh, since you know the, that prior Saturday. And so it's been two weeks now. Um, and and so the the following Saturday. Uh, I go in to, to get in it and I was going to drive it down to the exhaust shop, have them cut out my old muffler, have them weld in this new one mm-hmm. and, uh, and it wouldn't start. Well, see, that's where I was going. I thought you were going to say, well, I welded blah, blah, blah. And I went, ah, you probably fried the PCM or, uh, uh you know, it's something it didn't like. Um, do you have anybody that, uh, I mean, you thought about swapping out the PCM, I guess. I did swap out the PCM oh, and, uh, and, and still no bus. No so, bueno. Uh, Say no bueno yeah. instead of no bus. Nope. <laughs> so uh, no bus, no bueno. So I even hooked up a code reader. Uh, I yeah. got, you know, OBT, OBD2 uh, onboard diagnostic uh, second generation code reader. And it laughed uh, at you. Did you well, not see the no bus? Well, in a way, <laughs> in a way, yeah, uh, because it, it wouldn't connect. Yeah. It would not connect to the PCM. So, uh, you know, I, I do oh. all this troubleshooting. Ooh, that and, is and, really strange because if that's the case, because that's a connector way down low underneath the dash. And now mm-hmm. you're away from I, I don't know maybe maybe some reason it does route up through the the cluster but that no bus you know quite often is a ground issue that you know that you said you've already checked but oh, wow you got some serious issues there yeah yeah I do and it's the, I mean like I said the Jeep is is dead in the water and it's it's not moving right now so thankfully this happened while the Jeep was in my my own yeah. garage and you know not on the freeway or God forbid on the trail or something like that. Uh, so this this has me very very nervous. Yeah. Because here, if I do 
trace down or let, let's say I, I get the Jeep to start, but I don't know what I did. You know, let's say <laughs> yes. I, get, I get the Jeep to start, but it's like, you know, all I did was wrap on the dash or replace. Where's it, uh, yeah, you know, it going to die the next time? Uh, you know, when I'm 600 yeah, miles away. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So and then not having what I need to repair yeah. it uh, mm-hmm. or something like that. So. Yeah, I'm I'm very very nervous about this. This is a very unsettling problem that uh, that I that I'm very desperate to to fix at this point. So, well, and understand um, too, so you can make sure that you have it fixed, that you're comfortable yeah. with uh, with the Jeep. Oh, let me remind you real quick, and all our listeners, while you're poking around in there, and I'm sure you're doing it. I'm really telling the listeners, make sure that you're careful about the airbag stuff. Because yeah. you could definitely set off an airbag, and it may hit you in a way that you didn't want it to hit. So, guys, uh, and I'm just going to give you a very, very quick tip right now. If you run into an electrical issue and you decide to do your own troubleshooting, uh, I highly recommend not using your average test light. And by what I mean by that is the test light that you go down to the auto store and buy that has an alligator clip on one end and a very pointy screwdriver with a light bulb in it on the other end. And, and if you probe the wrong wire with a test light like that, you can do damage to your electrical system in ways that you would never imagine, including if you probe a airbag circuit wire, you can actually pop those airbags um, and they would deploy uh, in that way. So uh, keeping an eye out for airbag uh, circuits, they are always, always, always wrapped in a yellow loom. Those are airbag circuits. Now, that doesn't include an, uh, a fuse for the airbag circuit. Generally, those are labeled, uh, so you, you, you'd be safe there. But... Uh, in, in any case, make sure you, if you're doing some electrical troubleshooting, uh, that you use a logic probe. These are airbag safe, uh, test lights that, uh, enables you to probe wires at will without worrying about backfeeding voltage into the circuit and potentially tripping or deploying an airbag. Ruin your day really quick. Yeah, and and it it's expensive. Even if it, uh, even if it misses you, it's going to be really expensive to replace uh, and uh, probably a little less safe uh, not uh, not replacing it, not having one in. You know, I was surprised, uh, at least down here in Texas, uh, airbags aren't required. If I wanted to change my steering wheel out to uh, one of them old-style, fancy-type custom uh, steering wheels like we used to do back when I was a kid, I could do that. Mm, very nice. Yeah, I yeah, don't know I don't if that's all over or what. Yeah, I don't know what the... Uh, uh the laws are up here about that. I mean, I see guys with older Cherokees that were pre airbag that mm-hmm. of course have like a grant steering wheel or something like that. But, uh, uh, but yeah, nonetheless, um, yeah, I, I don't know about that. And in any case, I wouldn't want to pop an airbag because not only are they expensive to replace, but, uh, it's going to mean that you're gonna have to change your shorts too. Yes. Well, uh, good luck with, uh, with testing that. And I hope you, uh, have something for us next show to tell us what it was. Yeah. And, Makes uh, two of us. <laughs> uh, hopefully it was, it'll be something simple and, uh, you can say the the classic line, why is it always the last thing you check? Yeah, right. <laughs> and the answer is because it fixed it, damn it. I didn't have to look any further. <laughs> well, let's see. I uh, I still have that tick. I uh, I uh, tried, and I'm not talking personal. I mean the, uh, the lifter ticking in my, uh, oh, 24,000 mile engine. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, kind of sad. I did the... Uh, I put the ATF in there, ran it about 100 miles, and uh, did the oil change, and uh, got a little better, gets a little worse, gets a little better. Uh, I, uh, I do not know what the process is. I'm sure it's easy to look up. I do not know what the process is of checking the gap. Uh, I guess it's called the uh, the backspace or the lash of the uh, the valves. You know how the rocker arm moves up and down, and you can put a feeler gauge in there and tell what the, the distance is between the push rod and and the uh the rocker arm uh but uh, 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 uh matt smorenberg was telling me that i could actually uh shim that uh that little tick out of there so i uh as of right now and of course it's not saturday saturday i tend to get really lazy but as of right now i'm thinking i might pop the valve cover and uh you know first look up the process of uh, uh checking the the gap between the rocker arm and the push rod and i'm sure it has to do with the engine position uh, because, uh, hmm. you know, with, uh, where the cam is and how it's pushing the push rod up. And I, I'm sure I need to get it where, uh, the, the, it's at the very bottom of the lobe because that would be the lowest point for the push rod. And, uh, then I'll be able to check and see if the, the rocker arm has any play in it. And, uh, if it does, I should be able to, uh, uh since I have a, 
a crane cam in my uh, 4.0, which may be the yeah. problem with this tick thing anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had to shim each of the rocker arms. It's something you have to do uh, whenever you do a, a higher lift uh, cam like that. So uh, there may be a shim that needs to be taken out. Oh, well, now that you're, I guess, would be considered well past the break-in uh, right. period for that engine, uh, uh, maybe there is some stuff that you have to go back in and undo or redo or adjust, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Matt did all that stuff, uh, you know, one day when I wasn't there, uh, when he was rebuilding the engine, uh, he, he, he did all that uh, lash settings and uh, did it under uh, to the specifications that needed to be set at. So I never, I never uh, experienced it firsthand. So now I need to go back and see how to do it myself. And of course I, I can always call Matt and say, Hey, I'm seeing this. Why am I seeing this? And he can verify what I'm doing and, uh, uh, you know, get me on the right, uh, the right direction. So I'm hopeful that will happen, uh, that, 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 that'll happen this weekend and this long weekend. And, uh, hopefully, uh, that'll take care of any little tick. The, uh, the horsepower, the gas mileage, everything else seems to be fine. I just don't like hearing that little annoying tick. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it just makes me feel like the engine's not at its prime uh, running capacity, uh, horsepower and, and, and gas mileage say otherwise, but still, this is how you feel. So, yeah. uh, if, if that doesn't work, then I guess I'll, uh, I may try some of that, uh, what is it? Marvel mystery oil, uh, or yeah. some sea foam. Yes. Yeah. Slick 50 sea foam, uh, Marvel mystery oil, engine honey, you know, all those sorts of things. I, I would caution you on some of that stuff though, Tony, uh, do your research on it a little bit uh, because some of that stuff can gunk up some of the finer, the, some of the smaller oil passages, mm -hmm. uh, and you end up doing more harm than good. So uh, just be very careful about what sort of additives you end up putting into your in your engine. I will say this, that uh, my, my grandfather, myself, I've sworn on the slick, sworn by the Slick 50 brand of, of, uh, of additives. Uh, it is good stuff, and as we all know, Marvel Mystery Oil also has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, but uh, a little birdie told me one time that stuff is basically just transmission fluid. Yeah, that's kind of, I was reading, uh, I'm not reading, I was uh, watching some YouTube videos, and uh, it was funny because they were doing like reviews on uh, some sort of product to get rid of uh, uh, noisy engines. And the guy would uh, open it up, and he goes, He'd be pouring it in. He goes, yeah, it kind of looks and smells like transmission fluid. <laughs> and if that's the case, I've already done that. So, uh, and also too, it seems like a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I've been reading and, and seeing on YouTube has to do with very high mileage engines. And there's, uh, some gunk build up and, you know, something basically has blocked the passage either partially or, or completely, uh, in the, the hydraulic lifter and it's not pumping up all the way. So uh, I'm a little concerned that my low mileage engine is having this issue uh, it, and, and any additive that I might put in there is not going to do anything since it probably isn't gunk in the engine. I'm afraid that it might be uh, even the teeth that uh, are on the bottom of the uh, distributor and perhaps the, there's been some metal shavings happening from uh, the interface between the cam and the distributor. So maybe this isn't gunk that's in there. Maybe this is actual metal, and that's what's keeping it from uh, from pumping up. Now, I didn't notice anything when I, when I changed the oil. So, uh, I mean, no pistons or anything fell out. Uh, if, I, if I was going to do it the right way, I probably would uh, pull the oil pan off and then do a, a complete visual inspection. And I was thinking today, I was just sitting there kind of mulling over my head. Now, if I took the rocker arms off and took the oil pan off, I could pull the push rods out, and I bet you I could get those lifters out from the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a roundabout way to go. go well, you know, it, not but, taking uh, the head and the intake and the exhaust and all those things you got to take off just to get the head off, and then you, you have to replace the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the head gasket, and yeah. uh, the, those, those bolts you can use twice. And uh, I, I'm, I'd have to check with Matt, but I'm almost certain that those are a, a brand new set of head bolts we put on there. So I could, you know, take that off, take that head off and reuse those bolts again. Well, I mean, at least you got that going for you. I mean, it sounds like a, a fairly lengthy project, Tony. I mean, I, I, I would expect that that's not exactly something you could probably knock out in a day without really, uh, you know, a lift, air tools, maybe a couple extra hands. 
uh, mm-hmm. and getting up early and cracking. Well, you at never know what you're going to find. Long. And and as I was listening to the the podcast where you were taking out the the, the little bitty old uh, what's that bushing uh, and the leaf spring. I mean, gosh, that's that's like a thirty minute job, a, a two hour job maybe, and it took yeah. you five. And that's what really really worries me because you you get the head off and you look down in there and then you don't know what you're going to find. Uh, I mean, uh, for me to actually do this job in a, in a quick way, I really need a whole new set of lifters that have been soaking in oil, and I need a new cam because, it, you know, the cam could be the problem. It could have flattened well, out. If it's, yeah, I was going to say only if, it, if, if you had a lobe that kind of flattened out or there's some scoring or, or something like that. Uh, geez, you know, that, I mean, that sucked because, you know, basically you got to, you got to, you know, pull the radiator and or pull the engine to, to, to get that out, you know? So well, if, if you remember, whenever we first put this engine together, uh, they sent us the wrong crane, sent us the wrong lifters or bad lifters because those lifters were different sizes. Yeah, I was going to say you had some different sizes in there, didn't you? Yeah. Right. So it messed up the cam. And uh, I, I sent all the lifters back, and I sent the cam back, but that also meant I had a replacement cam and, and uh, another set of lifters, and they weren't crane lifters this time. I learned my lesson. And, uh, but Matt was uh, able to remove the cam out of the engine with it still installed by removing, I don't know if he removed one of the, uh, uh, one of the um, well, what do you call those plastic inserts for the grill? He either removed the, the header uh, altogether, the header panel altogether, or removed one of those inserts, and he said it slid right out. So I know I don't have to, I don't have to do that. Uh, I, I would not have to lift the engine up out to get the, the cam out. But, oh, my God, you might as well just put a new engine in there. I, at some point, I think it's easier just to rebuild a – you know, the, the original engine is sitting in Matt's shop. All I have to do is get him to take it to the machine shop and put some pistons in it and i don't know hey, at what point is it when you just swap engines i mean make it like a racing a racing crew deal yeah 4.6 liter stroker port and polish the heads I, i'd say you're you're uh you're, you're well on your way and you've got uh, three days to do it ready go <laughs> yeah and that's the other thing you know no matter how many plan how much planning you do no matter how much new things that you buy no matter all the steps that you go through, I guess it would be different if you did it all the time, but, but our plan was, or my plan was one day engine swap and the one day engine swap, uh, turned, ah. turned in to be about 16 hours. And even at that, I had to leave it there. Yeah. And I think it was there for like two weeks while Matt worked on it. So it, it, it just, it did not go the way it was supposed to go. Yeah, I'm. Uh, if I don't, if sorry, I've, I've kind of threatened this online uh, earlier this week. If I can't get this fixed out, I'm going to say that's it. The Jeep's getting parked for the rest of the year, uh, probably through, through the entire winter, and uh, I'm just going to do a V8 swap or something like that. You know, screw well, it. Well, you know, I'm kind of thinking the same thing. I went through all this trouble of uh, building this two thousand plus dollar engine, and now I've got this ticking noise. And uh, maybe I'm overreacting to this, but because uh, it's it's a very common thing with 4.0s, but it just bugs the hell out of me. Uh, hell man, I forget what the, the, uh, the iron versions of the LS one is, you know, maybe it's time for me just to put an LS one in there. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing or, or even doing a, uh, what is a, uh, like a 5.9 liter Hemi or something like that. I think that would oh, be yeah, pretty Oh yeah. Yeah. I just, badass. I love V eights. My, my little yeah. foot, my little right foot just loves the V eights. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's i would break i would start breaking stuff like you wouldn't believe <laughs> oh but having the horsepower is so much better than not i mean mm, you know yeah. um and I, i'm trying to beef up this 4.0 60 over and uh, the crane cam and uh, then you get the problems of the springs it's a lot like raising the you know lifting it up and putting bigger tires and all the other things that goes along with having to make the changes so things work right because you know you're getting out of the engineering specs and uh, I'm just almost ready just to say, screw it. Let me just put a uh, drop in a, a, a crate engine in there and there we go. get an adapter <laughs> plate and uh, uh, maybe a, a, a six-speed Muncie if, if they make those sort of things and just just go nuts, man. But anyway, uh, that's a lot of money. And uh, let me see if I can just uh, shim out that tick <laughs> before I do the rest of that stuff. Well, speaking of going nuts, we've got uh, Steve 4.3 LXJ that's going to talk about uh, what you could do to go nuts on a YJ. Yeah, and actually this is one of those uh, Wrangler segments, all things Wrangler, that we haven't had in a while. And in fact, I'll mention this, if uh, Steve certainly is stepping up and giving us a a Wrangler segment for tonight. But if uh, you know Wranglers and you would like to be a part of the podcast, please contact us. 
uh, just, uh, you know, what, what, what is it, Josh? Info, uh, interviews, uh, pretty much anything you like. Let's, let's go with interviews. Interviews at, at X- xjtalkshow.com. Yeah, at xjtalkshow.com. But, but contact us, and uh, it's really simple. You just record it, and then you uh, send it up to our Dropbox. We edit it and throw it onto the show. So it works out really, really a lot easier than what you probably think. So anyway, yep. let's get over here to uh, Steve. Lifting a YJ, this is part one of two. On this section of Jeep tips, I'd like to address lifting a YJ. There are several of our members that have them, and uh, they're quite a bit different from the uh, Cherokees, Grand Cherokees that uh, we normally deal with here on XJ Talk. But uh, it's worth talking about, and uh, one of the issues I want to address is lifting them. So this will be the first of a two-part series on lifting a YJ. Uh, YJ is kind of a little bit different animal than uh, what we're used to nowadays. Uh, back in the day when uh, Rambler or American Motors, if you prefer, uh, bought uh, the Jeep brand from Kaiser, uh, they uh, manufactured CJs and eventually improved them. They put V8s in them and uh, the 4.2 liter straight six, which eventually became the 4.0 that uh, we're all very familiar with in our Cherokees and Grand Cherokees. But uh, they had made some attempts to improve them. And one of the first attempts on the CJ was the uh, CJ5 and 7 that they started to produce in 1976 and went through uh, 86 or 87, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, it was produced for about 10 years. They upgraded the transfer case and they tried to upgrade the suspension. And in doing so, they went from the venerable and tried and true tested, uh, very common inch and three quarters inch wide leaf springs to a two and a half inch wide leaf spring in the back and a two inch in the front. And uh, then they also gave a hard top uh, uh, option available from the factory. And this was kind of a cool thing in cold weather. Uh, it actually allowed you to retain some heat in these things when they were driving around in the snow. But uh, to be honest with you, the suspensions were just horrible. And if you had the hard top and the heavy duty, quote unquote, computer engineered design suspension, uh, they were just roll around like a round bottom boat on the ocean. And uh, they just cornered terribly. And there was a lot of criticism of that. And I think rightly so. Uh, the attempt was to make them ride better than the CJs normally did, but in doing so, they just uh, ended up with a vehicle that was just really lousy on the road. So the next generation came around, uh, the YJ, uh, they uh, went to a two and a half inch spring in the front and retained a two and a half inch in the rear and they really kind of lowered the center of gravity a lot. And in doing so, they made a Jeep that uh, cornered well, and uh, it was uh, a decent off-road rig. Uh, it wasn't very high off the ground as we measure things today. And there was uh, uh, an addition that allowed these uh, YJs to corner better. And that is a front pan hard bar. It's sometimes referred to as a track bar, but it's really a pan hard bar. And the distinction is kind of fine, I realize, but well, that's life. So uh, when we uh, start lifting these YJs, uh, it behooves us to pay attention to this because one of the things that uh, this pan hard bar was supposed to do, in addition to uh, kind of stiffening up the front end. Uh, sometimes it's actually called a sway bar, which I'm not sure we can really call it that, but sometimes it's called a sway bar. Uh, it kept the YJ from having bump steer. And if any of us have been around long enough and had a lifted CJ or, or uh, lifted uh, military Jeep, uh, one of the things that we all had to live with when we did that was bump steer. And uh, that is particularly true if you had a tie rod conversion, and all of us did because the uh, Pittman arm, uh, or I mean the, uh, 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 the terms escaped me. But anyway, they had a two-piece tie rod on the front. It was really junk, and you'd really get a lot of death wobble out of the thing. And the first thing to go was that. 
because it was just junk and it didn't allow you to lift your rig very much. So we all live with it. Every time you went down the freeway in your Jeep and you uh, hit the bridge going in, you took a dive to the right. Then you got to straighten back out. You got to cross the bridge and you hit another little bump and you took another dive to the right. And it was just something that we expected and we all lived with it. And the Panhard bar took care of this by making the front axle stay stationary relative to the position of the tie rod, I mean the uh, drag link. So when we lift our YJs, if we want to keep that uh, factory, nice, positive, straight steering, this is something we have to address. Now there's several ways that you can have mild lifts on a YJ. And the first and most common is the extended shackle that goes on the front and back. And you can get anywhere from an inch to an inch and a half lift, depending on the length that you use. It's a heavy duty shackle. They're very common. I don't think I've seen a YJ lately that didn't have one of these. Uh, the factory shackles weren't too much to write home about, which is typical of Jeep's history. So uh, these were a nice upgrade, gave you a little bit of lift. Uh, the only thing you had to watch about them was is that the, the shackle did hang down from the bumper. And if you uh, got any of them too long, uh, you would end up hitting things. Uh, I have a friend that uh, has a YJ that had really long shackles and uh, he put a body lift on and so forth, put some 39 and a half inch swappers on, took off up to Fort Ice uh, and ended up banging one of these shackles on a rock shelf and it bent the front uh, leaf spring back, ruined the spring, and it also took out its transfer case when the drive shaft bottomed out. So bottom line here is that you can put these shackles on and that's okay, but you got to watch how far they hang down and you also have to be aware of the fact that they're out there and you don't want to be hitting anything too hard with them. The next thing that you can do to them is to get a higher arch leaf spring and you can go up to about four inches of lift this way. And when you do, having that high arch spring on there, the drag link gets down at an angle and has to be lengthened in order to center the steering wheel. And in doing so, the uh, uh, drag link being at an angle, when you hit a bump, it becomes horizontal and the uh, knuckle then goes to the right relative to the uh, rest of the Jeep. And so this is what causes the bump steer. And in order to get rid of that, there is a product on the market that I think is a really cool idea. It's not very popular, but I think it's great. And it's a, an adjustable um, hand hard bar or an adjustable sway bar, if you prefer, for the YJ. And it's put out by JKS. They're the only ones I know that make them. Uh, it telescopes. And when you want to hit the trail, you just done loosen up a bolt and the thing slides in and out. It's greased. It's got a nice boot on it. Uh, costs about $245, and it's really a great addition, I think, to a Jeep that has uh, less than six inches of lift. So when you go to get these higher arch springs, if you want to keep your highway drivability, this is a great addition. And these uh, higher arch springs, uh, they come in uh, different lifts. You can get two inch, three inch, four inch, and that's about the limit uh, that you can go on these because after that, you get something that's too stiff and unworkable. And that's it's a nice upgrade. You can do the uh, installation of these springs. Oh, if you you know have some jack stands and a floor jack and an impact, you can change these out in about four hours if you want. Um, not hard to do. And, and it makes a nice upgrade. You don't have to really change anything around. And uh, that makes it nice. And four inches is a nice little bit of lift. You can run some 33 inch tires. And if you want to do some bump stopping, you can put some 35s on and you'd be uh, uh, a little bit limited on your articulation, but it's doable. And it makes your YJ a nice looking rig and certainly makes it more functional off road. Next time I'm going to come back and talk about some other upgrades that uh, you do that require a little bit more than just bolt-on uh, goodies for lifting it.
Boy, I tell you what, uh, listening to that leaf spring stuff on the front reminded me of my 83 Chevrolet pickup, short wheelbase Chevrolet pickup, uh, four wheel drive. And uh, I think I paid like 170 bucks for a four inch lift. It was blocks in the back and uh, new, uh, new leaf springs for the front. And it was a very simple, simple lift. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised what a, like a shackle relocation bracket and uh, or yeah, a shackle reversal kit rather. I'm sorry, and uh, yeah. and some you know lift shackles will do to a YJ as far as improving its stance. Uh, I mean, I've 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 worked on several YJs over the years, and and you know, really, it's very simple, very very simple suspension to work on. Yeah, as long as you can find one that's in uh, decent shape and hasn't been highly modified, you can uh, uh, generally pick those things up. Uh, certainly not Cherokee prices, but and compared to other Wrangler prices, they're a lot better. And uh, who doesn't like square headlights on a Wrangler? <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I think that's uh, about all we have time for tonight, kiddies. Yep, that's going to wrap up the show, guys. Uh, Remember, any one of you guys who've got a, well, a wheeling experience you'd like to share, maybe uh, something you've done to your Jeep recently, or or heck, maybe you've got one heck of a Jeep story to share with us, why not? Give us a call, let us know about it, we'll set up an interview and get you guys on the show. Everybody's got a Jeep story to tell, including you. If you got a show and shine, an off-road event, or any other Jeep-related event uh, for that matter you'd like to share or spread the word about, give us a call or email us at the same place you would for a Jeep news story at newstips at xjtalkshow.com. Yes, yes. Oh, well, don't forget about uh, following us on Facebook. Uh, or is it friend? I'm sorry. Friend us on Facebook. Follow us on oh. Twitter. Uh, what? I was going to say, speaking of Facebook, uh, everybody's been been uh, hounding me about my shirt, so I hear I'm oh, going to yeah. stand up and show everybody the shirt. That's the uh, the shirt that everybody's been screaming about. I got it through uh, Teespring, and, uh, and and yeah, it's been getting uh, been getting quite a buzz about. It. Everybody's jealous about the shirt and throwing money at the computer screen and wondering where <laughs> I got it. Uh, you know, and uh, there's been some trademark issues going on with it. So, uh, guys, this was a, a limited print. You're probably not uh, likely to see this shirt ever so again. So that reminds me, uh, Steph, or Stevie as her mom calls her, show listener and uh, past interviewee, uh, made mm-hmm. a comment on your post about that shirt. She says, there's two things on there that I really like. And I, <laughs> yeah. I, I looked and I couldn't figure out. It's like, okay, Cherokee is a given. It must Unibody. be Unibody. No. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, don't know it. <laughs> Obviously, the trademark uh, aspect of it is it's in the it's in the uh, the shape and yeah. kind of font and everything of a Jack Daniels bottle. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I saw this. I, I had to get it. I really should have gotten two. Yeah, uh, really popular uh, post. Were they all black or did they have other colors? No, it was uh, no no choice in color. It was yeah. uh, it was all black, just like the the Jack the, the Jack Daniels label. So, uh, but yeah, like Tony said, guys, over at Facebook, a lot of stuff's happening. I posted up some goofy pics today, so head over to Facebook, <laughs> like us, friend us, whatever it takes, and you guys can join in on the fun. Yeah, and if you pay an extra five bucks, you can see the off color things he did with that throttle body. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, and uh, let me remind you guys to do the reviews. iTunes, uh, Stitcher. We've got two reviews at Stitcher. Uh, I know there's not a, as many people listen to on Stitcher, but go over to Stitcher and leave us a review. Uh, yeah, thanks we for appreciate. It. Thanks for being here tonight, and you guys have a great Jeep week. We'll see you next time.